Подожди еще пару минут, пока мне не начали говорить официально. Это так, будут такие вещи, которые нельзя использовать против нас. Ну, когда скомандуете, я и начну. Ну, и еще пару минут подождем, пока Хорошо. соберемся. Хай. Хай. Uh, I'm finally here. Okay. I see that you are here. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the next speaker for the next week. Ah. Jose Brox. Yeah. But it will be at 1 p.m. Bulgarian time, not uh, 4 p.m. as now. Because he, he is uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh -huh. Yes, in Spain. So yeah, so it's it's later than usual, yeah. But yeah. Mm. sorry, okay, it's just nine yeah. o'clock at my place. <laughs> ah, yeah. From you, even now it's too early. <laughs> For me, no, no, actually, no. no. Okay. 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 Maybe we start. Okay. Um, this is six, um, uh, 16 or, or Bulgarian time. Mm -hmm. And probably there will be other people who join. Um, you see, um, I think there is no need to represent um, Leonid Makar Limanov, but I, um, nevertheless, I'll tell a, a couple of words about him. He was a student of Shafarevich. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, no. No, I'm sorry. You just, well, actually, I quarreled with Sefarevich on many occasions. Okay. But I, yeah, I talked to him, of course. Uh, I was student, you won't believe it, of Landis, a guy who was doing partial differential equations. Yeah, I know that your first papers there on partial differential I equations. Have, I have yeah, a couple of words on differential yeah. equations. But after this, um, in, um, the first thing which I know and which is still alive, this is the theorem which you prove independently from Anastasia Chernyakevich that the free algebra in, in two generators has a group of automorphisms which are all tame. And then um, you have a lot of really nice results, but uh, I should mention uh, um, the non-commutative division ring, uh, which is algebraically close. And recently, you a year ago, you had a talk in Brazil, and the advertising was that in, uh, in German, Bulgarian, and Russian, the non-commutative rings, division rings, they are called uh, 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 bodies. 
So the people speak about Makarlimanov body. So this is not me. This was discovered by uh, Ivan Shestakov, this expression. But now I think that uh, in, in, uh, you're not only a, a, an excellent mathematician, but, but also an excellent person. So please. Thank you. I will thank you if the other people switch off their microphones and uh, the, the cameras in order to make the, the life easier. Okay, so I can start? Sure, you can start. So I share the screen. Share. And I hope you confirm that you can see this screen now. Right? Can you see it? Yes. Okay, yes. wonderful. Yes. So, so I won't bother you. But okay, now, um, if you decide to interrupt me and ask question, I'll really appreciate it. Well, I like when I'm asked yeah, questions. So here is abstract, which you saw probably. Yeah? And uh, so let's go along. So what is the Jacobian conjecture? Uh, the Jacobian conjecture I'm interested in is when you have two polynomials and two variables over field of complex numbers which satisfy the following condition, that their determinant of Jacobi matrix, which is this expression, partial by x, partial by y, partial by y, partial by this difference, sometimes we call it post on bracket on this algebra, is one. The question is, is it true then that subalgebra generated by these two polynomials contain x and y, that is, that it coincide with all these. So are these two polynomials actually generators. Now, uh, it's a natural question because if they are generators, then Jacobian is indeed non-zero constant and it follows just from the chain rule. It's from calculus because if you multiply Jacobian relative to this, yeah, of f and g relative to x, y, and then since x and y are polynomials in f and g, by Jacobian of x and y relative to f and g, the product must be one. And then it's product of two polynomials of x and y. So if product of two polynomials is one, both polynomials are constant. Now, geometrically, it also makes sense that because is it true that if we have a polynomial morphism of C2 to itself, such that it's locally invertible, yeah. uh, okay, so here, yeah, if it's locally invertible, is it globally invertible? Seems reasonable. But uh, say, what, yeah, what, what else? So history, briefly history. Uh, of course, we can ask the same question for any number of variables. The reasoning is exactly the same, that if you have a bunch of variables, a set of yeah, generating elements yeah, in the ring of yeah, polynomials of dimension n, if you have n generators, then they're Jacobian, again, matrix, determinant of Jacobian, I'll just, Call it Jacobian, is a constant. And the question about in, is it true then that this bunch of elements actually is generating set was asked by Keller. Okay, so here we have different Keller, not Keller from Keller manifold, but a Keller. Okay, uh, in 1939, for reasons which I don't know, he asked it over in polynomials with integer coefficients. Actually, there is no difference because uh, if you have a counterexample not with integer coefficients, then in larger dimension, you can build a counterexample with integer coefficients. But apparently he had some motivation, I don't know. Now, what he checked is that if the map is birational, which is to say that the field generated by these elements with Jacobian one is whole field of rational functions, then it, it, indeed it's invertible not only in rationals, but in polynomials. So then it's true. Now, what also else we can say? If n is one, then it's trivial, right? Because if you have a polynomial with derivative one, that's what it is, then it's a linear polynomial. And of course it generates a ring of polynomials and one variable. Now, uh, case two. It was proved that it's true in 1955 by a guy named Engel. Again, it's not Engel from Lee and Engel, but a different Engel. It's, it's a guy 
from then it was uh, democratic, whatever, yeah, democratic republic of Germany, eastern part of Germany. And that was his major work. And then uh, several proofs appeared. Uh, and uh, some proofs were even for arbitrary N. It was several works by Sigre. Again, it's not the father, but the son, but anyway, it's actually he's quite a prominent mathematician. Then interestingly enough, there is another proof by Grobner, you know, this Grobner from Grobner basis fame. He also proved, he thought that there is a proof by Segre, but he gave a different proof. Okay, so, you know, when everything is proved, still it's a beautiful question, so people were still thinking about it, maybe giving a better proof, but yeah, it's formulation very simple, it's attractive. Mm, uh, and it's it also, it, it's kind of a subtle problem because I will show you an example that if you replace polynomials by rational functions or by analytic functions, then it's not true. So there is something very specific in the fact that it's given by polynomials, that it's actually uh, integral morphism. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, sooner or later, all proofs with exception of Engel became wrong. And now the question became open for n larger than two. And finally, uh, Engel's proof turned out to be wrong. And uh, the history how it was discovered is not completely clear. When I came to the States and spoke with Apianker, he claimed that he knew about mistakes, but he never announced it. So uh, official announcement was done by Vitushkin in 1973 in the speech uh, which he gave in Tokyo. And it's interesting. So uh, around 1970, we with Vitushkin were meeting once a week, once a week thinking about this problem. And uh, none of us can read German, I'm sorry to say. I'm very bad with languages. So uh, what I suggested that he will take a couple of his graduate students and force them just to read it with dictionary and until they will hit some place where they will be confused. And pretty soon they provided us with such a place. And then Vitushkin wrote a letter to Engel asking him to tell some subtle point there about what is going on. And he didn't answer. So Vitushkin wrote another letter. And the answer was the following. I gave a talk in Shefarevich seminar, Shefarevich was mentioned before by Vesilin, and everything was happy with this. Uh, so don't bother me, please. Uh, then I tried to find people from the seminar who would explain me a proof, and nobody could. So Vitushkin wrote to him again, look, either you tell me how to prove this or that, or I'll announce that uh, there is no proof. And he never got an answer. In the meantime, he signed a letter. I don't know whether you know it, but there is a famous letter of 99. 99 mathematician protested that Yesenian Volpin was put in psychiatric hospital. And so he became Nivoyeznoy. So he was forbidden to go abroad for several years. And that was his first trip. And so he gave a talk, yeah, there, he gave a talk there. Anyway, so for example, uh, in 73, Campbell, who is one of the people who really knows the Jacobian conjecture, uh, proved, uh, wrote a paper where he proved that if this extension is a Galois extension, so if the field of rational functions over the field generated by F is a Galois extension, then it's indeed automorphism. And in this proof, he was assuming that Engel is correct, uh, not that he needed it. And then, you know how it's a lengthy process of publication. And then he knew that from Vitushkin that it's wrong, and so he added it as a remark in proofs. So next important step was a paper by uh, Bass, Connell, and Wright which was published in the bulletin of the American Mathematical Society about Jacobian conjecture. They didn't know, but technique, major part of their technique was actually discovered by a guy named Yagzhev, who published it in yeah, no, 
Siberian Mathematical Journal, so nobody in the West actually knew about it. At that time, it was not translated. So anyway, and the problem became very popular and popular to such a degree that I think now it's in last classification, there is a special uh, subrubric uh, devoted to it. So that's your brief history. And now let's talk about what can be done. So there are two schools of thought for Jacobian. One is that for two it's correct, and I personally think that it's correct for two, but that it's wrong for sufficiently large n. And that's um, uh, you know, rather typical for problems in a fine algebraic geometry, that something is correct for small n and then becomes wrong for large n. Say, recently, Gupta, Nina Gupta showed that uh, this classical question about conciliation, which is ascribed to Zariski, which is not quite what Zariski asked, is wrong in dimension three in the finite characteristic. In dimension two, it's correct. But anyway, so that's one. Um, it's, other one is that it's correct for all n. Now, if it's correct for all n, then that's exactly technique which was developed by Yagjev and independently by Bass and company of the following approach. Uh, by adding variables, you can simplify polynomials. Uh, say, suppose you have uh, x mapped to x plus y in power four. You can introduce two variables additional, u and v, then replace them by u plus y square and v plus y square, and then subtract from what was it, x plus y in power four product of this u plus y square and v plus y square. And then it will become smaller. And since this is an automorphism, if original thing was a counterexample, it stays counterexample. So with this approach, you can reduce your polynomials, so xi go to fi, all degrees of fi are less than four. Then with some chicanery, you can make it actually the following, that fi is xi plus purely cubic form. And so it was for many years, then there was some work by Zielinski, I think, that actually these cubic forms are cubes of linear forms, but finally, and that's the end of the line in this kind of development, it was shown that you, if there is a counterexample, then there is a counterexample of this form. Fi goes to xi plus partial derivative by xi of some form, homogeneous form of degree four. So then this part become actually, uh, uh, of, if you look only this part and then you take Jacobian, then Jacobi matrix become a Hessian of this function. And then you can ask nice questions about. So example of a question from which a Jacobian conjecture would follow. So suppose you have a homogeneous polynomial f of degree four, which satisfies the following condition. That Laplacian operator, this is standard Laplacian operator, applied m times to m's power of it is zero for positive f. Is it true that if you go far enough, take enough so m, which is large enough, then this condition, would it imply this condition that actually f and power m plus one will be killed by m applications of Laplacian uh, operator? So it's really interesting. And from this, Jacobian would follow. Uh, uh, that's kind of cute. There's actually this approach was developed by Wenhua Zhao, I think, yeah, I keep forgetting his name, though I've met him on many occasions. And actually it, built, it, it was start, started in the work by uh, Oliver Mathieu, who wrote this interesting paper, some conjectures about invariant theory and applications. So it's something like this, suppose you have on a circle a uh, trigonometric polynomial uh, such that uh, integral over the circle of this polynomial and all its powers is zero. Is it true then that if you multiply this polynomial in high enough degree by another trigonometric polynomial, then this integral is also will be zero. So it's not for circles, but for compact uh, Lie groups, but it's kind of interesting and new approach, which is not really well developed. There are some 
dubious statements in this paper, but the idea is certainly good. Okay, so here is your history, here is approach, and now I'm forgetting about, yeah, oh, okay, known cases, yeah, known cases. So when it is correct, if uh, the powers of the right sides, these images of XY, uh, of XI are less than three, then it's, it's a work by Stuart Wang. Then there is really peculiar result of the following nature. The two fall coefficients are real numbers, linear part is identity, and all other coefficients are negative. Then it's again automorphism. It's some kind of a Brouwer principle thing, whatever. Now, as I mentioned, if this is a Galois extension, and there are several actually papers on this topic, there is a paper by Campbell, which I mentioned, there is a paper by Razar, there is a paper by Wright, and also Ernest Winberg, the, the name who you probably know, unfortunately, passed away recently from COVID. He was actually interested in Jacobian conjecture. Well, he also yeah, proved that in Galois case, it is automorphism, but he never published it. Okay, so now we can, I think, forget about n-dimensional case and let's talk about two-dimensional situation. So why is it difficult? Because as I mentioned, there is something specific about polynomials to make it true if it's true. Say if you take two analytic functions like this, their Jacobian is certainly one. And uh, it's far from being one yeah, to one. It's actually pre-image of every point is infinite. Here is example of a couple of rational functions such that subfield generated by them is proper subfield. Yeah? If you take x squared and half of it, then, then, then it's yeah, extension has degree two. In finite characteristic, of course, it's wrong. It's even wrong just in one variable case, yeah, if you put x to x plus x in power p, where p is characteristic, derivative is one, but it's certainly not a generator. Okay. So the difficulty is the following, and a lot of people gave proofs thinking that uh, this mapping is proper, because then, uh, since it's locally okay, you will have a algebraic function looking, so looking at, say, at x as algebraic function of f and g, it will be algebraic function without singularities in a fine plane. And then of course, you say, yeah, it is a polynomial. But uh, the problem is the following that, and it's possible to do it with polynomial maps. Of course, nobody managed to do it with polynomial maps by pair with Jacobian one, but what is happening is that you have a infinite curve on the plane x, y, <clears throat> which is mapped to a finite curve. So point in infinity here goes to a finite point here. And that's the problem. If somebody would manage to prove that it's not the case, then it would be, it would be done. Now there is a bizarre property of a counterexample if it exists. So that's kind of curious, so I decided to mention it. So suppose you have a counterexample, then there is an algebraic curve on this plane and algebraic plane on this curve. And then you take a tubular neighborhood of this algebraic curve. So all points on distance less than one. And then the following happened under this mapping, this tubular neighborhood. And here you have also tubular neighborhood, not like this, but also finite tubular neighborhood of algebraic curve. So there is an exchange tubular neighborhood of this curve go to complement of tubular neighborhood of this curve and complement of tubular neighborhood here goes to tubular neighborhood of the curve here. So it's really bizarre. When I first saw it, I decided that's the end because it seems obvious that you just cannot do it with polynomials, but no, you, you can. If you, you can give a couple of polynomials with this property, yeah, with this mapping will be with this property. But of course, again, Jacobian is not one. Now, if you think about building counterexample, well, then even with computers, it, it won't be easy because there is a paper by Moore, by Moore in 83. Uh, he showed that there are no counterexamples if total degree is less than 100. Now, it's possible that one of the cases is a bit problematic. 
and I probably mention it again later. So what we can do? Other possible line of attack. What is the geometric degree of this extension? So what is the degree of extension of this field over this field? So Keller showed that if the fields are the same, yeah, yeah, if the fields are the same, it's this D is one, then Keller showed. If it's two, then this extension necessarily go up. If D is three, then situation is more complicated. And Daryevkov showed, uh, it's Stepan Daryevkov, by the way, son, no, no father, showed in 86 that it's the case. For four, he did it with his student. And for five, a guy named Segrey from Hungary, it was his PhD thesis, showed that if D is five, then in fact, D is one, cannot be five. Now, uh, so that would be great if we will be able to estimate this D. But estimates are very far from five. So the best published one belonged to Yitang Zhang. That's the guy from the twin conjecture fame. I, I, I'm sure you all heard about him. Uh, so he proved in 1991 that in his PhD thesis that D doesn't exceed the total degree of F. So what does it mean in practical? You have F and G. So it doesn't exceed the smallest total degree of F origin. Okay. Now, here is the story about Moch. It seems to me that, uh, you know that he was a student of Moch, actually. He was a student of Moch. He was thinking about Jacobian conjecture. As everybody else, he solved it, but then he found a mistake. But never mind. So Selvage did by giving this estimate. It seems to me, and I'm not completely sure, that he found some glitches in this paper. And Moch, who is not very friendly guy, to tell you the truth, became pissed off with him and never wrote a recommendation letter for him when he was looking for a job. And then you know probably, you read about said story that he was delivering food in Chinese restaurant, blah, 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 and so on. Anyway, so that's it. So what we're going to do today is to improve his estimate, but still it's very far from five. It depends on degrees. And so there is no much hope to proceed in this line of research because it's becoming more and more difficult. And so okay, so what next? Next is something which is related to Newton polygon. Again, I presume that you all know it, but let me remind you what is a Newton polygon. So if you have a polynomial, and now I'm talking about just polynomial in two variables, well, of course, this construction that you have, Newton polyhedron can be done in n-dimensional case. You do the following, you take all monomials which are coming in this polynomial with non-zero coefficients. And then if you have monomial xi, yj with non-zero coefficient, you mark point ij on Newton plane. And then you have a bunch of points, you take their convex hull, and this convex hull is called Newton uh, polygon. In this context, it's interesting. It was discovered by Newton, and I will mention why. But for whatever reason, he told it, Newton, he, no, he didn't call them Newton. He called them parallelograms, I don't know why. Also, he always included the origin uh, in this picture. So you all, he always marked origin. But we will see why he was doing it. Okay. So now here is the next possibility of attack. Uh, suppose we have a counterexample. Uh, then, of course, if we apply atomorphism to F and G, then the result is still counterexample uh, because of alpha was some morphism is an automorphism, and this morphism was an automorphism as well. Now, uh, you can do something with this polynomial F applying automorphism. And it's known for many years that if counterexample exists, then there is an automorphism such that Newton polygon of this automorphic image of F contains a vertex MN, again, different authors. I prefer for whatever reason, I don't know, that N is larger than M, N and M are not equal, of course. You can always switch X and Y and then make M larger than M. Anyway, so here what is known. So N is larger than M, larger than zero. So you have this vertex, you have vertical line, you have line parallel to bisectrix, and your Newton polygon has this vertex and sits inside of this trapezoid. 
So it's known for many years and uh, I don't know there are maybe more than 10 works explaining it from different positions. Now, actually, it's interesting that the technique which allows to do it was developed by Dick Simier in his rather famous paper in which he described the group of automorphism of the first Y algebra of a non-commutative algebra. It's algebra with two generators, X and Y, in relation X, Y minus Y, X equal to one. So when he was uh, yeah, working on this question, researching this first algebra, he developed some technique which turned out to be very useful in commutative case as well. So uh, here you have uh, brackets, commutators, and they're replaced in commutative situation by Poisson brackets and that works. Okay, so what, uh, so how, how you can prove that there is an automorphism with, yeah, which makes this counterexample uh, having this shape. Yeah. It's because of the following. So if you take a Newton polygon of your polynomial, I think I made some lousy pictures, but anyway, I'll, I'll look at them later. Uh, then uh, if you take an edge of this, then it corresponds to a leading form of your polynomial relative to some weights. It's not necessarily homogeneous. Yeah, homogeneous it's when the weights are one, one, so it's then parallel to bisectrix of the second and fourth quadrant. But if you give different weights, then you will have say weight of X is two, weight of Y is three. And then you're looking, you're presenting your polynomial as sum of homogeneous components, and then you have leading component. So leading component will sit exactly on an edge of Newton polygon. So with every edge, you can associate this homogeneous form F of E. You're just taking only those monomials which belong to this edge with their coefficients. And then you have this, well, quasi homogeneous form because it's not one, one, but anyway, you can think of it. Homogeneous just for weights which are not necessarily the same. And then because you have this Jacobian equal to one, it's possible to show, and it's not very difficult. That there is a form H such that Jacobian of this form with H is the form itself. And this H is a polynomial under certain conditions. And this is a rather strong restriction which tells you that F of E cannot be arbitrary, it's very special, and that allows you to make automorphism which will uh, make this Newton polygon into this trapezoid. Actually, this is kind of a smallest possible size if you say take area then and that would be your uh, goal you take f take all automorphisms of f and look at area of newton the corresponding newton polygons then the smallest area would be exactly with this trapezoid and uh, for many years that was what we know and uh, we couldn't improve it and then relatively recently but this relatively recently i looked it was 10 years ago so for me, it's relatively recently, maybe for some of you, it's ancient history. So Piret Kasunage showed that actually this leg, which is parallel to bisectrix of the first quadrant, contains only this vertex. So actually it's sharper, yeah. And that was completely new technique. And uh, it is based, it turns out, yeah, he made a rather delicate research of behavior at infinity of these algebraic curves given by f is equal to constant. But then it turns out that you can deduce it much easier. And it is based on the fact that natural log of x is not an algebraic function. So uh, yeah, uh, and yeah, so that's what it is. She published it, yeah, in Russell test, and then I published it I don't remember. I think it was an issue devoted to the memory of Abyanker. So uh, if you want algebraic, heavy heating algebraic geometry, quite interesting. You can read this paper. If you want just a simple proof, you can read my paper. So that was, yeah, okay. Now uh, it leads to the following very interesting open problem, uh, which yeah, I, I shared with experts, but unfortunately, they don't know the answer. It's the following. Uh, describe all algebraic curves 
on which this form y dx is exact? It's an open question and it's interesting. It's certainly not an easy question to answer because if you think about it, it's tempting to assume that it's only curves of genus zero on which you can do it. And not all of them, but okay. it turns out that it's completely wrong. And say, if you take this curve, then y dx on this curve is exact. And this curve is actually birationally equivalent to the case Fermat curve, x in power k plus y in power k is one. And when by raising k, you can make genus as large as you please. So that's kind of a, the end of the story in this direction, in a sense. Yeah, you cannot improve it anymore with automorphisms. And somehow we want, if we want to proceed, we need to see what is inside of this Newton polygon. And we don't know, we didn't know how to do it for many years. Okay, so what to do? What to do, what to do? So it turns out that uh, there is one possibility to sort of look deeper, which goes back to Newton. Now, uh, why Newton invented his Newton polygon? His idea was he wanted to solve, he wrote a short letter, Old Oldenburg, I think, I don't remember, uh, with two parts. In the first part, he suggested this famous Newton algorithm, how to approximate root of a polynomial in one variable. And in the second half, he wrote how to solve equation like this. This is a polynomial in two variables, where you perceive y as variable and x is as known quantity. So what he created, what was later became known as Piezo series. Piezo, we covered them, what is it? About yeah, 200 something years later, or not quite, well, close to 200 years later without knowing about Newton. Newton did pure algebraic thing. Piezo was concerned with convergence. So, uh, yeah, I, I cannot pronounce it properly. Anyway, so um, what you can do, and I think I have a picture. Let me look, let me look. Okay. Aha, uh -huh. so here is the picture. <laughs> here is my lame picture. So suppose this is your Newton polygon of your polynomial. So how you, what is the Newton process of resolution? You take this edge and you look only at this form and you are trying to solve it for y. So it's a, some polynomial of x and y. Now, since it's homogeneous, solution would be some fractional power of x, say if it's x squared minus y, or y cubed minus x squared, and y is x in power two thirds, right? So something like this, and if you, since it's homogeneous, uh, it, it can be presented as product of homogeneous forms, which are looking like y, in power a minus c x in power b and c this coefficient of, is actually root of corresponding polynomial in one variable if you just make it yeah optimization like if you have say just homogeneous sum x squared plus x y plus y squared is zero divided by x squared and denote y by over x by z and then you have just polynomial to solve it so if you do this you have first summoned and then you rewrite polynomial you write that it is P of X, say it was F, yeah, say polynomial P of X, Y. P of X, and then you take this solved piece plus Y instead of Y. Then of course, fractional powers of X appear and you have next Newton polygon. In this next Newton polygon, there is this curve, which was maybe longer or shorter, will become something. And then will be next edge attached to it, you use this next edge to find next summon. And you proceed and so after infinitely many steps, you will get a solution. Picture will be something like this. Yeah, it, this line will become horizontal. So no points here. So when you plug y equal to zero, it is zero. So let's look what I wrote here, probably some explanation here. So by iterative process, starting with an F, take edge, solve equation this, it's quasi homogeneous, you can solve it. Here is this example. Then consider this Newton polygon next term in solution, which is yeah, next edge attached to the modified P is responsible. And so on, so you have what? 
and you have two possibilities. So if your polynomial has degree n in y, it has n solutions by decreasing powers of x and then solutions by increasing powers of x. So you are getting n pictures, n pictures like this. And these pictures describe the same polynomial. So somehow they should be mysteriously connected. It's not clear how, but one should determine another, but it's completely not clear how to do it. And also how to connect expansions by decreasing powers and increasing powers. Uh, and uh, that was, was bothering me. And then I saw some way how to connect all these pictures. Uh, a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit. Nevertheless. So that's related to this, our main topic, which is called Newton polytope. And what is this Newton polytope related to this pair, Chekhov and F and G? Uh, uh, since the shape of F and G is very special, actually this triple is not arbitrary. It's not arbitrary generator. It's this X in which your Newton polygon for F is nice. And because, by the way, of Jacobian condition, Newton polygon for G is actually similar to Newton polygon of F. So it's again trapezoid there. So you have an algebraic dependence of these three polynomials. Why it is the case, you can look at F and G polynomials in variable Y over this field. Then, of course, all of us know that two polynomials and one variable algebraically dependent. So you can write dependence. Of course, you can make it irreducible. And you all also can clear up all denominators uh, yeah, which are polynomial, polynomials on X. And so, so you will have you will have this relation. And then uh, it turns out that Newton polytope of this relation actually captures something from all two n pictures. Basically, I was using only n pictures when you are solving y by decreasing powers of x, because these are faces which face infinity, which are in this in Newton polytope of this one. So that's what I'm trying, I will be trying to explain. Okay. Okay. So there is, uh, it turns out that the right way to look at it, and that's the difference. That's a little bit of a breakthrough. So, of course, people were thinking about this dependence, and they were always thinking about x as algebraic function of f and g. Here I replaced f and g by variables just to write formal dependence, right? So x was algebraic function of f and g, and then it was not clear how to describe the shape of this. Polytope. It turns out that the uh, other way to look at it is to think that, so you have this algebraic function, which now G becomes algebraic function of X of F. You also have this expression, F is, yeah, replacing F X Y is, then Y becomes algebraic function of X and F. And so this algebraic function turned out to be very much connected. And that allows us to describe the faces and edges of this polytope of Newton polytope of this relation. And that's kind of interesting because this edges, as I'm saying, is capturing something from all n pictures. So what 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 is the necessary ingredients for this? First observation is that Y belongs to the field generated by X, F and G. Or even if you fix X to some constant, then still these two polynomials on level of a field generate all field. And this is this follows from Leroux theorem. Uh, this follows from Leroux theorem because if you remember what Leroux theorem tells you, that if you have two polynomials in one variable, or well, actually two rational functions in one variable, then subfield generated by these two rational functions is field of rational functions. Actually, if it's yeah, if these two rational functions are two polynomials, then actually this subfield is generated. You can choose generator to be a polynomial, and that's the key of explanation, because if f of cy and g of cy are polynomials in of ry, some polynomial, then just because of Jacobian conjecture, you make some computations, which probably don't need to bother you with, but it turns out that then when you take Jacobian and substitute X equal to C, 
then it belongs to the ideal generated by derivative of this polynomial, which yeah, generate subfield generated by f of c and g of c. And then, of course, since this is one, this derivative better be constant. So this polynomial is linear. And that exactly means that subfield generated by these two guys contains linear polynomial, therefore contains y. And then, so that's nice observation. And then there is a connection between roots of this polynomial, and so y is perceived as algebraic function of x and f, and g, which is perceived roots of this one. So what are this connection? g i is actually this little g computed in y i, and y i is some rational function which appears from this statement. Yeah, if you have a rational function which appears from this statement. So there is this wonderful interplay. There is this wonderful one-to-one yeah, -one correspondence between roots. So here now is some explanation about leading forms. Again, not really necessary, I think, for us. But uh, so what is it? Weight degree functions. So if you have polynomials here, you're ascribing some weights to variables. So not like in standard situation when weights of all variables are ones, they're different. And then you can present any polynomial. Yeah, so then weight of a monomial is just some of the weights. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, alpha is more weights of xi. And now just add it. And then for a polynomial, you have support its collection of all monomials, which was non-zero coefficients. And then degree relative to this weight of this monomial is maximum of degree as polynomial of maximum of degree of appearing monomial. So you are getting some function which actually has all properties of degree function. Yeah. Degree of product is sum of degrees. Degree of sum is doesn't exceed maximum and so on. Okay. So and of course you can write polynomial as sum of homogeneous forms, homogeneous relative to this weight, and then this leading form, the heaviest form would be its leading form, yeah. Now, if you look now at monomials which appear in Newton polyhedron, and you look at a leading form corresponding to some weight, then corresponding part of Newton polyhedron is a face. Well, it can be vertex, it can be edge, it can be two-dimensional face. Well, of course, the nicest faces are of co-dimension one, because yeah, say in our three-dimensional cases, two-dimensional faces, that's what are more interesting and yeah, they're defined. So that's connection between leading forms and Newton polyhedron. Okay. Now uh, explanation again of this Newton process. So if you have yi, and I think I'm rapidly running out of time. So you can solve it. And here again, the explanation this first term, but not. Okay, so um, it's, it seems like complicated process, but in fact, when characteristic is zero, it's not such a bad process because suppose you have in this expansion by fractional powers of x, x and power m over n, where m and n are relatively prime. Then this expansion corresponds to n possible solutions because you, what is x and power one over n? It's, it's kind of symbol, but of course, you can replace it by x and power one over n by epsilon x and one and power n, where epsilon power n is uh, yeah, one. So with one fractional expansion, you're actually getting a lot. So denominators cannot be too big because you will get uh, more than more solutions than degree relative to y. So that's kind of a rather neat process. Okay, so that's what we have, and you have this. So, uh, okay, yeah, I'm certainly, yeah, was, yeah, not, not yeah, uh, yeah, my time frame is certainly not right. But now you have this Newton polytope, and it contains information about different pictures. So, how it is containing? Uh, if you take a um, uh, face of this polynomial, two-dimensional face, 
then you consider corresponding leading form, then you take irreducible factors of this form. Now, if this irreducible factor is some connection, there's some relation between X, F, and G. And that's the forms which are interested in, where irreducible um, factor of this form, which contains all three variables. Then you can start solving it for G. You can use Newton process to start solving, start expressing G as algebraic function of X and F. And then uh, you will get something which doesn't depend on F only because X is involved. And then it leads to situation that uh, there is a form in X, Y, which represents the leading form of F. There is a form in X, Y, which represents the leading form of G. And this commutator of these two leading forms must be one, because otherwise Jacobian won't be one. So you have some nice pictures uh, along these lines. Yeah. How many minutes do I have left? Zero? Somehow, yeah. I, so okay. Will... Um, um, you, um, you have maybe um, 10 minutes, but you can continue because. Okay. Um, okay. So, okay. So, um, a bit more, I think it's okay. 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 So, so uh, uh, now there is also some information uh, how to, uh, well, if you thought about it, uh, uh, as I mentioned, if you have two polynomials and one variable, they're algebraically dependent. And the standard way is to write some big determinants, so called Sylvester determinant or whatnot. Well, this Sylvester determinant doesn't tell you much about shape of the resulting polynomial, about how it is constructed. So it turns out that there is a rather nice process which allows to find this relation. And in, uh, because of shape of these two polynomials, F and G, relation between them always has the leading form like this, at g in some power minus c f in some power. Because of Jacobian condition, the leading terms are proportional to each other. We have this in all in power new. There is some coefficient dependent on x. And this a and 0 and b0 are relatively prime. What well, a0 by n is degree relative to G and B0 by N is degree relative to F. So that's are actually top degrees. So there is a need form. And then there is, yeah, something further, further on. But so Newton polytop of this situation contains an edge which corresponds to this one. So there is, this is an edge, right? Because the uh, leading form would be the top power here of X. So it will be X and power K multiplied by this. It's a homogeneous thing and it's, yeah, correspond to edge in Newton polygon. Now there are next observations. From lemma on y, it follows that a degree of p relative to g is actually a degree of f relative to y. Here it's y. This field over this field, yeah, of course, uh, the extension is by g, right? So it's of this extension is equal to degree of this polynomial, right, relative to G, this one. On the other hand, we know that this is C of XY over C of X. So then it also degree of Y. So of course, similarly degree of P relative to X is degree of G relative to Y. So that's what you have. Next, the following observation. If you put instead of X lambda, then the same is true for relations of these two polynomials. Okay. Now you remember the shape was that leading term was X in power M by Y in power M. So whenever you put X not equal to zero, resulting polynomial still has power N relative to Y. And this means that if you take dependence P lambda, minimal dependence of F lambda Y and G lambda Y, then it has the same degree as P when you replace X by lambda. So what it means that if you replace X by 
non-zero lambda, then the leading form is the same. So how is it possible? It's possible only if this polynomial has only one zero, when x is zero. Because when x is zero, then this leading monomial disappears. You're getting smaller degree polynomials. Relation is smaller. So that's next observation. This coefficient is just power of x. OK, great. Wonderful. So then what you'll do after that, you divide by this. So this is p over p0 of x. You divide by this. You're getting after that polynomial monic in G, right? Because now this form is what you see. It become monic in G, monic in F. But it may have negative degrees of x. OK. Yeah, because when you divide by x and power d, you can. So now our next idea is to show that actually there are no negative powers of x. So that this coefficient was actually just constant. And why it is the case. So imagine now you have this Newton polytop. And my I always perceive it like this, that plane fg is horizontal, x is vertical, unusual maybe. And here you have this edge corresponding to this form. And this edge, of course, is contained in two faces, upper face, which is called fa, phi a, and lower case, lower face, phi beta, phi b. <laughs> OK, phi, yeah, phi, phi b. And what I want to show that actually phi b is flat. So what am I assuming? Am I assuming that there is a, there is a negative power of x, and that's what I want to bring to contradiction then? F beta will be below the floor. It will be below the floor. And of course, it's not parallel to x-axis, right? Because there are some negative powers of x. It will be some slanted plane. And that's what I want to research next. So this phase, phi of beta, phi of, phi, phi of b. So if it's the case, then I can take weight of x to be equal to 1, weight of f and weight of G will be negative numbers. Of course, there are some rational numbers. Yeah, it's some, yeah, because all points in both are integers. OK. Now, uh, next is, and since I'm running out of time, let me be brief. Uh, you look at this face. And this face, that's yeah, and corresponding leading form. You expand it in, uh, yeah, in, yeah, factor it and reducible factors. And next claim is that all these factors cannot be just depending on two variables. Because if they all depend on two variables, then it's a homogeneous form like this, of course, with weights 1 and rho, homogeneous form like this with weight 1 and sigma, and homogeneous form like this with rho and sigma. Newton polygon of this is interval, interval, interval. So. If just one interval presented, it's impossible, yeah, because we have already interval and some additional points. If you have product of only two things, then it's a parallelogram. Or it is a, a polygon with six sides where opposite sides are parallel and the same. And just by multiplying, you know, this Minkowski multiplication of polynomials, so uh, of, of uh, uh, polygons. Uh, and uh, it, F, B cannot be because it contains this long edge. And whenever you cannot have another edge parallel to it on the, in, because it all sits in this triangle. And the triangle you know, with this base E and then it becomes just smaller and smaller. So if you draw a parallel line to it, it will be shorter. So because of that, you have a factor which depends on all three guys. And then it turns out that it is supported by forms of what one of this, if you take one of the solutions, so I have to skip it. I have to skip all this. And so what you have, you have some partial solution and Newton polygon of this partial solution. I didn't finish here, you see it's a hat. So this is, yeah, in uh, terms obtained in Newton process. So then this Newton polygon of this expression. And it's again, in Newton polygon, though, there are fractional powers of x, but never mind that. And then you plug the same expansion into G. 
So this pair, because of this substitution, still has Jacobian one. And then there are two edges, which when you look at them and look at the forms, that these forms have Jacobian one. And this rather easy to bring to contradiction. So here it is. You have these two edges and this Jacobian cannot be zero. So it must be one. And now I'm looking at the picture. I think I, I draw a picture here. I try, okay, I draw a picture. So this is an edge which supposedly supported uh, Y. So here, what is it? So here I have, so here is my, here is resolution by increasing powers of X. So you started with this edge, then with this, and then you're proceeding. Now there is this edge. And since by the process, MN sits somewhere above it, uh, below it, right? Because here is MN, right? And so this edge below it. So now here, how it works. It turns out that rho, you remember, was negative. Rate of X is one. It turns out that this edge, if you extend it, runs through the point rho because otherwise that's the way it must be. And this other point is on level one one minus sigma and rho and sigma are both negative. So picture is like this, this is one and one. So it intersect this bisect with in low point. It intercepted here. So it cannot have this vertex to be above. And this simple minded consideration tells you that the floor must be flat. Then what you are doing next, you are looking at upper edge and now it's expansion by decreasing powers of X, but considerations are exactly the same. Again, this phase has irreducible component and this irreducible component is supported by some edge like this. Again, you are solving, solving, solving. Here you are hitting edge. So this edge now by construction should, if you extend it, should go below this vertex. The same consideration tells that it runs through the same two points, but now rho and sigma are positive. And so if you look at this ray and write the condition that it sits below, uh, that M and N is above it, and also you recall that rho and sigma are related, right? Because they have this, you remember it was H G in power A zero minus F in power B zero. So a zero sigma is equal to rho B zero. It allows you to make simple minded arithmetical computations and estimate rho and sigma. Okay, so it's very straightforward. If you have this line, how it, this thing sits at this point, MN sits above it, and you're getting estimates for a rho and sigma like this. Actually, you can make them strict because certainly this edge this edge, what, it's the next picture, right? This edge cannot run through this point because then it will hit X axis in a point which is smaller than one and it's impossible. So it's a strict inequality, which is of course not this important, but be as it may, after you, after that, since it's a homogeneous, if you extend this upper face, which may be not, yeah, FA, it may be not necessarily triangle, but it will, hit x-axis certainly on or above degree point of x. Yeah. Okay, so then you can estimate this degree. And so that's what you're getting. Where b0 and a0, you always can assume that degree of g relative to y is larger than degree of f, not divisible by it because otherwise you can go to smaller pair. So you're getting this estimate, which is certainly better than Zhao's estimate. And now to finish up what you have here, you can show that all edges of NP are not slanted. Again, with considerations that if edge is slanted, then it's supported by something of reductions. In this case, it's supported by vertices and you can easily bring it to contradiction. So all edges are parallel to coordinate planes. And then you have the following picture, the shape of NP. So you have this edge 
in the plane uh, x o uh, f o g on, on the floor then you have trapezoid with next edge parallel to it maybe it's all triangle but you don't know so it's trapezoid then after that another trapezoid more inclined and so on so it's a bunch of trapezoids and then at the end you have ceiling which may be a triangle again with upper edge which is parallel to edge e so all edges are parallel to e with exception of edges which are in coordinate planes of x f and x g and there this there are two polynomials the uh, polygons there with corresponding vertices are connected by edges by edges parallel to this edge so that's all simple minded of course it's, i think it's too much to absorb but uh, it is going to be published pretty soon in russian and english in Izvestia. and so if you want if that's your notion of your yeah, fund you can read it and that's kind of interesting so what is conclusion so np contains some information but it contains information about special edges not about all edges of newton polynomials of reductions of this when you solve it uh, so there is a possibility to create a polygon starting with this polygon which contains more information and that's what i'm trying now to understand and if i understand i think there will be some progress and with that i want to thank you for being such a patient audience hey, thank you very much okay so now i'm stop sharing and now i can see you <laughs> okay so that's what it is yeah so that's what it is thank you very much do you have any questions or comments okay I just, Every, everybody is bored to death right <laughs> no 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 i just wanted to know if you're going to put the slides somewhere so that oh because... excuse me once again yeah are you going to put the slides online somewhere oh i i okay oh, there is some version of it as a preprint in max planck institute mm -hmm. so you can look it up there and as i say it's going to appear pretty soon in in Zvestia, in Zvestia of but but in russian right no ah, yes. simultaneously in russian okay. and in english okay it was also interesting story because they want papers in russian and they translate them into english so yes. they told me we're so busy with this it's a special volume devoted to vitushkin and we know that you know russian maybe you will translate it and so i tried and i discovered thing which completely amazed me i was taking big pieces of English text, I was putting it into Google Translate, and I was getting really nice translation. Of course, it was far from perfect, but it was certainly good enough to work with it. Yes. It was really surprising because, yes. again, you know, many years ago, I have a close friend, Milchuk. People who know linguistics maybe know this name. So he was explaining to me that he was sure that they will be able to automatically translate special texts, like military texts. For example, mm -hmm. but the, to translate general text, it's completely impossible proposition. So he was wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really amazing, and even recognized that there are formulas which it did, doesn't need to translate. <laughs> he was trying to translate some parts of formulas, but typically it was just don't touch. It was really amazing. So it was much faster than I expected. Yes. Any, uh, in your presentation, you didn't say any theorem. You had lemmas, methods, etc. Et right. Okay. So theorem, there is no theorem. There is just this wonderful new estimate, yeah. which okay. is. So the, um, your ideas, I understand, because the audience is mixed. There are logicians here. There are mm -hmm. other people. This is you start um, uh, with something which is with Jacobian one, for example. Yeah, yeah. You study both F and G, you study only F. Well, in a sense, it's enough to study F. Enough because to study uh, F. The, uh, on level of Newton polygons. Um, you start with Newton polygon similar. and uh, you, you, you make some procedures and, and you finally estimate mm -hmm. um, for the degree of the field extension which you have. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes, exactly. That's, that was the. Uh, okay. The goal, of course, was just to look. Okay, originally, when I discovered that this polygon can be researched 
uh, I was just looking at what can I say. Okay. So uh, that was uh, possible application to give a better estimate. But uh, well, you, you can prove some other stupid things with it, but you know, I, I suspect that in the paper, I also included some result of Abianca about some, if situation doesn't have many characteristic pairs, there's some nonsense, yeah. It's actually boring. I, I, I did it only because I, I want to pretend that this technique is helpful, okay? And it is helpful to some degree. But of course, again, it, it's just beginning of this line of attack because this polynomial contains some information, but far from all information. And then you can, with Newton process, to create from this polygon some other polygon, uh, polyhedron, polytop, which contains much more information. And if I would be able to understand what's going on, then it will be more substantial progress. But even this estimate, I, I was quite happy, you know. I was quite happy to get a better estimate. Uh, maybe we should give an advice to the public. Don't try to solve the Jacobian. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah, no uh, yeah, I forgot to tell it, yeah. But I usually start my talks that if you don't have tenure, don't okay. work on Jacobian conjecture. And it's not completely a joke. I, I know at least three people whose life was destroyed, mathematical life, by attempts to solve Jacobian conjecture. Uh, many years ago, I worked with uh, Kanta Gupta, mm -hmm. and she wanted, uh, maybe we can solve the Jacobian conjecture. I tried <laughs> yeah. to explain that we are not experts, so this is hopeless. No, no, but by chance we can do. That's and yeah. I had the arguments Mm -hmm. I asked, um, uh, we asked uh, 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 Narayan Gupta, mm -hmm. if, for example, a person who, who, who is very poor in group theory tried to, mm -hmm. to find, uh, to solve the finitely basis problem. Is this optimistic? Mm -hmm. No, no, it's impossible. Okay. I think the same argument <laughs> worked to show that this is the Jacobian conjecture is not for us. <laughs> hey, okay, you know, by the way, that there is one Jacobian conjecture which is solved. Okay. If, if you take a free algebra with two generators, and it's characteristic free, and you take two elements such that their commutator is proportional to commutator of generators, yeah. then they are generators. So in it's free algebra, you have two elements, u and v, such that u and v minus v. Non commutative case. Yes, no, yeah, free associative algebra is c times a, b minus b, a, where a and b are. I think this is generators. wrong. Then it's automorphism. That's, and actually, if you take a billionization of that, it will lead to two polynomials with Jacobian one. So if you can lift any pair with Jacobian one to a pair of elements in free algebra such that their commutator is proportional, you will solve it. But, well, nobody managed to do it. Some other comments or questions? Uh, I oh. just... Okay. Stupid question, uh, Veselin. This is the same. Yeah. Uh, hi. Hi. This is the same as uh, classic uh, Jacobian in terms of automorphism. Is the same equivalent, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I, but yeah. I, I didn't understand what you asked, but apparently you are asking. The conjecture is, if you think it's a conjecture, that n elements with in uh, n variable case with Jacobian one actually are generators, so they are images of so generators this means that, under uh, uh, yeah. There is an automorphism um, which sends the variables to the corresponding polynomials. Yeah, and actually Shefarevich was yeah, thinking that this is true at some point. He thought that he proved the theorem, and that's why at some point our relations became a little bit strained. Uh, and uh, that was his idea how to define an infinite dimensional algebraic group. Okay, that group of automorphisms of uh, polynomial ring and variables becomes kind of algebraic group if this condition is just given by the fact that Jacobian of these guys is one. Okay. Yeah. You see, if formally the seminar is closed, but usually after the seminar we have chat like this. Okay, uh, that's, that's uh, nice. That's nice. I want to make an announcement. The next Friday, there will be a talk by Jose Brox. This is called uh, Identities in Prime Rings. 
So yeah, uh, uh, um, two days ago he had a talk in Barcelona. Okay, uh -huh. also virtual talk, and I, I like the talk very much. In, and I asked him to repeat some version of the talk the next Friday. So, what 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 time is your time? This is um, uh, one p.m. Bulgarian time. Oh, so three, okay. three hours earlier than you. But yeah, I, think I, I, will, I, I hope I will be asleep at that time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, you see, um, the talk in Barcelona was recorded in YouTube. Yeah. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. you can see something similar, oh, maybe okay. not the same talk, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if you write Jose Brox, mm -hmm. um, uh, Simba, Simba, this is um, some abbreviation for the seminar, not for the you know, uh, Lion King. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> but the same spelling, right? <laughs> yes, yes, the same, exactly the same. <laughs> and you can nice. find, uh, uh, and it's better to add also identities in prime rings. Mm -hmm. uh, can see the talk which is 45 minutes mm -hmm. okay and yeah. he being a younger guy is more disciplined than i am right it was really no, it, 45 minutes <laughs> the, uh, he's in europe not in the states so for him it's easier the, the yeah. time is so you've talked in barcelona right in real time i thought about like inviting barcelona, like inviting some of my friends in california and into this talk but then i decided that will be too cruel you know okay <laughs> And also okay. the program of the seminar, if you visit the homepage of the seminar, mm -hmm. is full till the end of March. There is only one call, mm -hmm. 19th of March. But there are two invitations. So if somebody wants to, to give a talk, you're welcome. You, you, you may contact me, but maybe you should be uh, only in April. Mm -hmm. Because we have logic, we have algebra, we have algebraic geometry, so this is... Mm -hmm. You want to mix them, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, in, uh, uh, ten years ago, there were two uh, departments in our institute: department of mathematical logic and department of algebra. And, and we decided to make one department: algebra and logic. So this is something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The seminar is for all these things. So this is. Oh well. Okay. What, I, what I believe of Lenny about Jacobian conjecture? What do you? Okay, I do believe you? that two-dimensional situation is correct. Yes. And for many years, I thought that n-dimensional situation is wrong. Okay. So now I'm kind of, I don't know, but you know, this is a belief which has nothing behind it, to tell you the truth. No, it has but some. <laughs> oh well, okay, well. In two-dimensional case, it has more than an n-dimensional case, as, as far as I'm concerned, you know, because I was thinking a lot about two-dimensional case. I never thought really about a multi-dimensional case. Now, this result by about Hessian is rather beautiful. That if there is a counterexample, that there is counterexample of very special form. And uh, I, I didn't mention the names. I think it's written there. It was Van der Essen and his school. Van der Essen is a guy in Nijmegen, in Netherlands, in Holland, who is also one of the guys uh, a little bit crazy about Jacobian conjecture, but he was smart enough not to put all his eggs in this one basket. So he is yeah, quite successful, but again, I think that it cost him being full professor, I suspect. I think he's still not a full professor. You see, for many, many years ago, he had some survey article with some problems, and mm. the advice was, uh, do what you can. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Ed, by the way, Ed, right now, thinks about Jacobian conjecture. Uh, uh, he retired, and now he feels free to think about whatever he wants. He moved so, yes. to, uh, oh. uh, 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 to Las Vegas because uh, 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 there is a good ch uh, chess club there. Well, that was one reason. Other reason, which he told me that you have a best, at that time, it was best bank for the buck. So <laughs> you could buy a good house there, cheaper than in other places. Um, one question. Why the tubular thing in the context sample is so ah, How it happens. Yeah, it, it's some kind of a, the following consideration. You, you, you certainly know this. 
that if you have a power series with integer coefficients, hmm. then convergence cannot be too big if it's infinite. <laughs> if it's finite, then it's infinity, then it's a polynomial. But otherwise, uh, you, you have considerations like this. And that's what you can sort of, uh, uh, yeah. I, I, I think I, I never published this. I published a, con uh, well, I not published, I, I talk with Bas about that when somebody else was publishing it and I gave him a counterexample. In what sense? Of course, this is a counterexample of two polynomials. Mm -hmm. which their mapping does exactly this thing, this exchange of tubular neighborhood, okay, with its complement. Uh, of course, Jacobian is not one, but they are two independent polynomials, so it's not clear how to use the Jacobian is one to negate it. But uh, that, that's not really a difficult result. Yeah, but I suspect that somebody published it. I don't remember who. Okay. Yeah, but again, I, I was really excited when I discovered it. You know, I, I also, like everybody else, I proved Jacobian conjecture many times. One time, <laughs> I was developing a series and I forgot to divide coefficients by n factorial, you know? <laughs> well, and they become, then convergence became infinite and you know, that everything was fine. And then maybe in the morning, the Jacobian conjecture is true and in the evening you have a counterexample. <laughs> it's exactly, but well, there is a famous joke about Rudin uh, who actually said that, that uh, he was talking, I don't remember with whom he told, well, we should prove this theorem as fast as we can before Adi Alexandrov built a counter example. <laughs> yeah, you know, the geometer who was in Leningrad and then in Novosibirsk. So, well, okay. Okay, so it was, an, it was a pleasure to see all you. And Vitya, are you in Brazil right now as we speak? Yes. Okay. Just, uh, I have a small, uh, just oh, about yeah. Google Translate. Yes. Everybody who knows Slavic languages, put in Google Translate Li Algebra or Li Super Algebra. It try to translate to Slavic languages like Ukrainian, Czech. Ah. You, will, you will see tr wonderful translations. Really? I think yes. that, that the only translation which is really good is to English. That's my No, f from Li, no, yes, when you translate, because Google Translate everything via English. And everything and that's is the problem, yeah. So if you uh, remove <laughs> So I, I, you I tried with Italian and it was complete garbage. Yeah. But I found it. some other site, I don't remember which one. Which I had another experience Italian. with Google. I was in Hungary um, for some exchange program and before I had to fill in some papers and the lady from the institute, um, um, the counter, um, the, um, um, she, um, she sent me a message uh, with a Google translator. So in all the places, instead you, I was um, he. Then I answered, dear doctor, uh, the, um, somebody, the answer, I am um, uh, not a doctor, I'm a, a human being. <laughs> the next thing was, uh, dear Mr. Somebody, I'm not Mr. <laughs> I'm female person. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a quote. Li algebra na Ukraine, na Ukrainian is translated as algebra brichni. <laughs> That's great. That's fun. Так, uh, Lying algebra. <laughs> in Czech language, les algebra, les algebra, uh -huh. les algebra. Okay, Czech, uh, um, um, for the females they are over, for example, Brigitte Bardot is Brigitte Bardotova. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I have to excuse myself because I have a grandchild I'm supposed to take care of because his parents, her parents rather, are working and <laughs> they want me to babysit. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, we thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I'm to stop recording now. Yeah, sure.